picture this. You're eight years old and you're at your grandma's house and you have a choice. There's a stack of dusty DVDs in the corner of her living room and you decide to peruse through them. Are you gonna watch the sticky copy of The Little Mermaid that your little cousin watched to death that only has disc two? Maybe, but something else catches your eye. A dog playing basketball. Oh my God. God. Air Bud was a series of films about a dog playing basketball and numerous other sports. I'd ramble on about how these films are secret masterpieces and perfect examples of both dog movies and sports movies, but come on, we both know that's not the case. I also have never seen them. Yeah, I was never really big on dog movies when I was a kid. Maybe it was because I read Where the Red Fern Grows as a child, and I know that if there's this on the cover, that dog ain't making it. Spoilers for Where the Red Fern Grows, I guess. But something I did watch as a kid was the series of direct-to-video spin-offs about Air Bud's children. The Buddies films, as they were so-called, were really a relic of their time, and frankly, they were a staple of any DVD collection in the late aughts. Clearly a way to cater to a young, puppy-loving audience, these films were really successful. I mean, they were successful enough to have seven of them and two spin-offs called Santa Paws. It's crazy to me that Santa Paws exists as a spin off of a spin-off. That would be like if there was a spin-off of young Sheldon about Sheldon's elvish friend he met in the woods named Todd. Something I find really endearing about these films right from the start is that the five main characters are the same throughout all seven of the films. Before we go into these films, I find it necessary to tell you who these characters are just to avoid any confusion. So, Air Bud's children are named Butterball, Mudbud, Buddha, Bee Dog and Rosebud. You might notice a sort of commonality between all of those names. Yes, they all have Bud in them somehow, except for Bee Dog, but we can assume that the B stands for Bud, right? Butterball is the most like his father, a sporty dog who likes to eat and to fart, although I only really say that he's sporty because he has eye black under his eyes, but really he just likes to eat and to fart. Mudbud is dirty. Buddha is a Buddhist and is owned by a Buddhist family, which if you think about it, is sort of like naming your dog Jesus if you're Christian. Bee Dog is a racially insensitive representation of a rapper. And Rosebud is a girl. And listen, I'm not trying to be sexist when I say that, but it is very clear that that is supposed to be her main character trait and that she was written by men. I would also call her the heart of the group. She's sort of the natural leader of all of the buddies. However weak and one note these characters are, I really do appreciate that they are at least somewhat consistent throughout all seven of these films. It helps me sort of understand these characters a little bit better and they serve as rather okay foils to each other. Anyway, now that we know our cast of characters, we can jump into the strange and bizarre world that is the buddies films. These dogs go everywhere. I thought since these films don't really tell a linear story that instead of talking about them in the order at which they were released, I could rank them. There's seven of them and we're gonna start with the worst, which also happened to be the first one that I watched. But first I need to make a bit of a disclaimer here, which I'm sure a lot of you weren't expecting when you clicked on this video. Uh, these movies are racist and really problematic at times. I wouldn't say it goes as far as being really actively hateful towards a group of people, but there are a lot, a lot of little microaggressions just sprinkled throughout that really make you question the director of these films. These films were all directed by Canadian director Robert Vince, and you can really tell that some of the ways that he views the world really seep into his silly dog movies. I wanna make it clear that I am not ranking these films based on how bad or how racist they are, this is a very fine line here, and I want to make sure it's clear I do not condone any of the gross things in these movies. And I will make it clear when these moments pop up in these films, uh, so just, I guess, buckle up for that. And of course, if that makes you uncomfortable, just letting you know. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump in to the Buddies films. I'm drinking Spooky Punch. That's gonna make sense later. Coming in last and at number seven on my list is Snow Buddies. Snow Buddies begins with a narration by a grizzled and stoic husky voiced by Chris Christopherson. 
There comes a time in every pup's life when they realize that there are forces greater than themselves at work in the universe. I like to refer to this type of thing as a wise dog monologue, or a dogalogue, if you will, and a lot of the Buddies movies start off this way. Here, we have the character of Talon, who will become a mentor to the protagonists of the film. We drop into Fernfield, Washington, the home of the Buddies, and we get to see their morning routines. Butterball gets his boy his lunch, Buddha is teaching a yoga class, B Dog is shooting hoops, Mudbud is dirty as shit, and Rosebud is, get this, picking out outfits. Alice, over here! Alice, you're my very best friend. It's probably as good a time as any to talk about the talking animation in these movies. Yes. It is really unsettling. I'll chop most of it up to a poor budget, but I think even with a really high budget, it is incredibly hard to make it look like a dog is actually talking. I much prefer the homeward bound method of animals and dogs talking where it's really just a voiceover by the voice actors and the audience just generally understands. And if you look at an animated animal talking in an animated film, you'll notice that they don't really look like the animal that they're representing, but this just looks looks bad and scary and scary and bad. <laughs> Luckily, the dogs are so cute that you don't really look at their mouths when they're talking. My eyes just naturally go to their eyes, so it's not that big of a deal, but just something to mention. The buddies find themselves in a crate of ice cream because Butterball is fat as shit and wants to eat a bunch of ice cream, but the crate is destined to go to Fernuatuck, Alaska. Fernuatuck, Alaska is not a real place, and I think it's our first example of something very racially insensitive in these movies. This name feels like it's making fun of indigenous linguistics, and it just rubs me the wrong way. It feels very odd. But I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. For now. Anyway, the buddies fall out of a plane. Bombs away. Oh. Oh. Dude, come on. Oh. It's a dream come true. We're surrounded by vanilla ice cream. That line is imprinted into my brain forever because it was in every single trailer for Snow Buddies. Wait, why did they fall out of the plane? Who delivers ice cream just by dropping it out in a crate in the middle of the woods? Wouldn't it have made more sense for like some guy who hates puppies to just throw them out of the plane with little puppy parachutes or something? Or even better, what if they did something like Puppy Point Break where only one of them has a parachute and they're all hurtling down towards the earth and it's a real test of endurance to see who can go the longest without pulling their parachute, and it would probably be B-Dog who pulls it at the end, right? That would be amazing! The buddies then meet Shasta, an Alaskan husky puppy who has a boy named Adam, who is our main human character of the film. Why are you laughing at my home dogs? We just saw a pack of huge wolves! Well, if you consider little old me a pack of huge wolves... <laughs> Adam has but one wish in the world. I want to mush. He wants to mush! But he has a dad who used to mush, and something horrible happened to him. The one time you race with Jean-Georges, you lose, huh? If it hadn't been for the accident, there is no way you would have won. Maybe. Which leaves you asking, what was the accident? And yes, the answer will shock you. Anyway, all Adam needs is a sledding team to help him enter the race, and wouldn't you know it, five golden retriever puppies just fell from the sky and met Shasta. And also wouldn't you know it, the finish line for the big race is right next to the airport that they need to get to to get back home. So the buddies train with Talon from the beginning of the film and hijinks ensue. One of my favorite moments is when Butterball falls down this hill and he just rolls down and, and you know, it's a big snowball and it fills up and his arms are CGI animated on as he just rolls down the hill. It's hilarious. And I love Talon in this movie. He's one of the best characters. He's very wise. And when the buddies don't need him anymore, he sort of just dramatically Yodas away. Thank you, Talon. I will never forget you. Uh, Butterball likes to fart a lot in this movie, and I wish I was joking, but this is literally one of his main character traits that is recurring throughout almost every single one of these movies. 
Ugh, why is it so green? It looks like the Breaking Bad intro. <laughs> There's also a villain named John George who wants nothing more than to kill everyone who's competing against him in the sled race. I'm not super crazy about John George as a villain. He's definitely not the worst villain in all of these movies, but he's certainly down there. His personality is just sort of French and needlessly mean, and in the big race at the end, he sabotages every other racer, and it's just really lame. <laughs> Oh, and racist. He's racist. That guy he just wiped out, he was Asian. I really can't stress enough that there's at least one racist moment in all of these films, other than B-Dog, who is just a walking hate crime. I'll deliver him the tail whooping of his life. Anyway, at the end of the race, Jean George is compromised and his dogs are falling into the ice of the lake that they were sledding over. Now, do you remember that accident that was teased earlier? Well, what it really was was that Shasta's parents died in this exact same race at this exact same point by falling through the ice. There's something I need to tell you guys. This is where my mom and dad died. We know, dude. We get it, Shasta. Your parents died. Stop complaining. What a weird response. Like, even if you know that Shasta's parents died in this really awful situation, shouldn't you let him reveal that to you and not just be like, dude, we know. Like, that's so dismissive. Jesus, B-Dog. Anyway, they win the race, they save the dogs, and the movie ends. Yay! Something I noticed while watching this movie is that I really love the score. There's actually some really good musical pieces in a lot of these movies, but this one definitely has the best score out of all of them. This song that plays while they're sledding sounds like a Mario Kart DS B-side, and it really adds to this nothing burger of a scene. Just watch. <laughs> The composer for all seven of the Buddies films, Bram Wagner, goes crazy in some of them. And, and here's the kicker. He only composes music for dog films. And you know what? He's pretty damn good at it. One of my favorite parts of the movie is this scene where the buddies aren't able to make it home in time for Christmas. And they set up these stakes pretty early in the film and you think, oh, the movie's gonna end with the buddies making it home just in time for Christmas to share it with their family. But Snow Buddies subverts this and there's this really deeply sad scene that shows all of these third graders slowly opening presents and longing for their lost pet. And I know that this scene isn't intended to be funny, but there's something so comical to me about these kids being all depressed on Christmas morning just because their puppies ran away because they wanted to eat a bunch of ice cream and ended up in Alaska. <laughs> Another great moment in this movie is when the kids go to the police to ask them to help find the buddies, and you think that the cops are gonna be like, get out of here, kid, we don't need you, we have real crime to solve. But the cop, Sheriff Dan, just like actually wants to help them, and he sends out an email to every single police station in the United States to look for the buddies. It's time to bring in the long arm of the law. I'm gonna send out an APB. That's all pups bulletin in law enforcement lingo. Asking all my police officer friends to be on the lookout for five golden puppies. Sent that off to every law enforcement agency from Timbuktu to Kalamazoo. And the craziest part is that it works, and that's how the buddies get home at the end. This guy's like the most helpful cop of all time. This cop is named Sheriff Dan, and he's a recurring character in all of the buddies films, starting with this one. He's just a comedic side relief character, and there are times when he's really chronically unfunny, but in this one, since it's his first movie, I actually found him just fine. Before the buddies get on the plane to go home back to Fernfield, they all say goodbye to Shasta. This scene 
is in every single one of the buddies movies. I like to call it the dog friend goodbye. And essentially it's each of the buddies saying goodbye to their dog friend with one line that perfectly sums up their one character trait. You really were our wish come true. Shasta, you're the best friend my brothers and I have ever had. Bro, remember what I told you. Yeah, <laughs> hang loose. <laughs> Shasta, you're now an official member of my posse. Big pup, I'm gonna miss everything about you, but your butt. <laughs> Aw, shucks. I'm gonna miss you too, Shasta. You're our soul pup. Namaste. Next time you're in Fernfield, look us up. If I didn't know better, I would think they're saying goodbye. <laughs> Shasta's like a mid-tier dog friend as well. I find that the dog friends I really like have strong personality traits and maybe a character voice, but Shasta is just kind of one note for me, and he just sounds like Dylan Sprouse. And then the whole movie ends with a cover of Lean On Me that has a jaunty rap. Out of the blue, your buddies appear. They're like instant friends and their mission is clear. Keep working together to make it all real. It's what you've been hoping all along you'd feel. Well, you can lean on me. This is an awful cover of one of the greatest songs ever written, but I can't help but kind of like it because it's so funny to end your movie with just a little jaunty rap. And so you might be asking yourself, Max, why is Snow Buddies last on your list? There's no way that this is the worst Buddies film. And yes, you're right. I'm putting Snow Buddies last for a few reasons. So I started my Buddies Marathon with Snow Buddies, and it certainly set the tone for the rest of my viewing experience. Let me put you into the shoes of me when I started this daunting challenge. I have to give another warning here, unfortunately. This story does involve the passing away of some very small little dogs, so if that's something you'd rather go your entire life without knowing, just go to this timestamp and you can just live in blissful ignorance like I did before I started writing this video. I'm so sorry. My viewing of this film started quite normally. My friend Kim and I threw on Snow Buddies late on a Saturday afternoon to see if maybe something could come out of this video idea. But as we were watching, I couldn't help but think that these dogs looked really cold. And since these are real puppies, I got to thinking, are these dogs okay? And one Google later, some really devastating news was revealed to me. So, a lot of this movie takes place in Alaska, and it was shot in British Columbia and 30 Golden Retriever puppies were originally purchased for this film. Puppies get sleepy, so even though there are only five main characters in this film that are Golden Retriever puppies, there needed to be more to fulfill the long shooting schedule. The way, however, that the Snow Buddies team handled this was really disgusting. You see, these puppies were all six weeks old, which is in direct violation of something called the Animal Welfare Act. Eight weeks old is the general age at which puppies are allowed to start being put into movies, and because of the young age of these puppies, they fell victim to a slew of parasitic diseases that were really common in British Columbia at the time. Parvovirus was the one that was diagnosed most often, and unfortunately, five puppies died on the set of Snow Buddies. And when too many puppies fell sick, the studio then decided to purchase 28 more puppies, all of which were exposed to parvovirus. This is a really tragic and awful situation it's really hard to talk about there's a lot of people who have been blamed for this happening some went on to blame the breeders saying that they were forging the document saying the puppies were older than they were some have blamed the filmmakers some have blamed disney and i guess we don't really know who's at fault here but overall there was a lot and i mean a lot of gross negligence involved in this production. And I can't help but blame the filmmakers and the studio. And the worst part to me is that the end of the credits of Snow Buddies, unlike the rest of the Buddies films, there's no message that says no animals were harmed in the making of this film. There's just this message that says the American Humane Society monitored the animal action. It's crazy to me that something like that could happen so recently. I don't even want to talk about Milo and Otis. And this is the least important part of it, but it really tampered my viewing of all of these Buddies films because I couldn't stop thinking about how puppies died during making one of these movies. I don't know how many different ways I can really express just how awful this is, though. And now we can still have a good time when we talk about these other Buddies films. There's plenty of goofs and gaffs to be had, but I felt it was really important to start the video by 
by talking about this, just to get the bad news out of the way first, I guess. And so everyone understands why I am going to be so negative in this video. I try when making these videos to keep a generally positive twist on everything and to talk about the things I liked and to put things in a good perspective. But when there's something as awful as puppy death or homophobia or anything like that, it's really hard for me to take away my own personal biases from the review. So yeah, the reason I'm ranking Snowbuddy's last might not be because it's objectively the worst film on this list, but it is because five puppies died on the set of it. I can't physically remove that from my brain and just say, yeah, well, Snow Buddies is one of the more enjoyable films. No, it's awful. In my opinion, it's damn near impossible to objectively review a film that involves the death of five puppies. Go ahead, tell me I'm wrong. Luckily, none of the other films involve the death of any puppies, but this goes to show that when these films are being churned out at sometimes more than a yearly pace, sometimes being bad isn't the worst part about them. But despite Snow Buddy's devastating production, it's not actually the worst film on this list in terms of quality. That spot goes to number six, Super Buddies. Super Buddies might be one of the worst films I've ever seen, but let's be honest, you probably already knew that because, well, look at it. I'll admit I'm coming at this from a place of general fatigue when it comes to superhero films. If it's not one of these, I'm not that interested. At least I should say any more because when the MCU was at its peak, I had a great time going to see those movies and finding out what happened to the characters and seeing where the story was gonna go. There is also something so exciting about being surrounded by all of these dorks equally invested as you, uh, but suffice it to say, I didn't go into Super Buddies feeling that way. This is one of those movies you know from the start is going to be a long watch. What's important to note about Super Buddies is that it sort of serves as a soft reboot for the whole Buddies series. Most of the original voice actors that were voicing the Buddies have all been replaced by new ones. Also, the kids are just different in this one, and I don't just mean the actors. Because kids this age tend to, you know, grow up, the actors in all of these films playing the owners of the Buddies change throughout them. But in Super Buddies, what really changes is the personality traits of these characters. Most importantly, there's a really big change in Bartleby, the owner of Butterball. Bartleby in the first six films is this preppy, snobby, rich kid, but in Super Buddies, he's just like this nerd who lives on a farm with his grandpa. You'll notice that there is hardly any consistency between these films, they hardly even reference each other, and honestly, that kind of makes it hard for me to connect with any of the characters other than the buddies. Anyway, Bartleby wants to be a super comic book writer. Gramps, I'm just not good enough. How can I become a super comic book writer if I can't even come up with one super idea? He collects toy versions of the five rings of Inspiron from Butterball's puppy food. These five rings of Inspiron are never really explained. They're just kind of infinity stones that give the buddies powers. The five buddies all find themselves on Bartleby's grandpa's farms, all dressed as superheroes. Why? so they could dress up as superheroes. <laughs> Once again, they all do things that fall into place with their character traits. Pretty much every one of these movies start like this, essentially setting up each of the buddies so that the audience knows that Butterball is fat, Rosebud is a girl, etc. The problem with Super Buddies, however, is that all of the characters are just horribly flanderized, and that was already really bad in the other one. But in Super Buddies, Every piece of dialogue said by a buddy has to reference their main character trait or their main thing. Your outfit is out of this world fantastic. It just screams girl power. Girl power is a state of mind. But There's a lot of lore to this one too, which you'll notice is a very common trait across the worst buddies films. Bartleby reads a comic book about these superhero aliens that look like furries, and this alien crashes into Washington and transforms into a dog and meets this kid, and then they become superheroes named Captain Canine and Kid Courageous. How clever. From now on, you'll be Captain Canine. And you shall be Kid Courageous. You know, without the rings, I don't have superpowers, right? My dad always said, you don't have to have superpowers to be a superhero. We'll use our intellect, bravery, and wits. I bet I would have liked your father. He sounds like a wise man. 
He was the best. This is fine as a message, I guess, if you mean like a metaphorical superhero, like a doctor or a first responder or something. But this feels like a rather dangerous message for kids. Hey kids, go steal your dad's police radio and go fight crime with your dog. You might notice that all children superheroes have powers, or at the very least they have extensive training from some rich guy who dresses like a bat. But Kid Courageous loses to Mr. Gun every time, I promise you. So it turns out that these comic books are real, because of course they are, and the buddies find the real rings of Inspiron. Whoa! Those look just like the rings of Inspiron! From my puppy chow! These look like the rings from my puppy chow! For some reason, Butterball has a really raspy voice in this one. I really don't like the new voice actor for him. The buddies get superpowers from the rings of Inspiron, and they go around to fight crime in Fernfield. This is the worst and most boring part of the movie, and it takes up a lot of the runtime. Somebody please help! Uh, I'm stuck up here! Cute costumes and all, but really, why don't you go fetch one of your human friends that can really help me? Shocker! The biggest problem with this movie is that they clearly didn't have the budget for any big action scenes, so there's just no interesting action in this movie. Like, did they spend all of the budget on this really gross and weird looking alien CGI? Because that was not worth the money, guys. Every action scene is just done in a basic shot reverse shot, and it looks and feels awful. Action films should have breakneck editing and movement, and dogs aren't particularly good actors for that. Anyway, there's a villain named Drex who is also a really ugly looking alien. I know this is a 10 year old movie and graphics have come a long way, but this is just so ugly. Drex is probably the worst villain out of all of them. He's just all around boring and his motivation is to just like destroy the earth with the rings of Inspiron? I'm sorry, but destroying the world really means nothing to me anymore. If we're all gonna die, the stakes are kind of pointless. I know that sounds really weird, but, but like, you know what I mean? Like, if everybody dies? Eh, you know, I don't know, maybe that's just me. And especially in a movie like this, where I know it's gonna end happily. Like, do you really think they're gonna kill off B-Dog? Oh yeah, speaking of B-Dog, he's racist in this movie too. I know I'm usually super fly, but dogs, now I'm super duper pooper scooper fly, yo! Captain Canine comes to rescue the buddies and help them hone their powers, and we get yet another training montage with their new powers. And there's more, there's more lore here. Essentially, the Rings of Inspiron don't just give you powers, but they take your natural abilities and then just multiply them by the umpth the degree. This is like a fine idea, but it makes no sense with the powers that they got. Butterball gets strength, B-Dog gets stretch, Buddha gets mind control, Mudbud gets invisible, and Rosebud gets super speed. Buddha and Butterball's powers are the only two that make some sense to me, but like, why does Rosebud run so fast? Why does B-Dog stretch? If this was realistic, B-Dog would become like, I don't know, a famous rapper, and Rosebud would get girl power. one from girl power. Rosebud talks about girl power so much that it's not even funny. Okay, I lied. It's funny every time. Welcome to the world of a blonde pup. They're gonna have to learn a lesson in girl power. Captain K-9 also overexplains everything in this training montage, which just leads to some of the worst foreshadowing I've ever seen. V-Dog, remember when your ring is activated, your body has the metabolic consistency of rubber. Electricity cannot conduct through rubber so only you can protect your buddies from a direct hit. One of my biggest pet peeves is when movies over-explain stuff like that. Like, I know it's for kids, but kids aren't that stupid, guys. They'll understand if they see, like, an electric puddle that B-Dog steps into and he's immune to it, that he's immune to electricity. Or even better, just show that Drex has electric powers in the fight and have B-Dog realize it then. You don't even have to do any foreshadowing for that. Even Sheriff Dan has been flanderized. He turns into a pig. <laughs> and his body is possessed by Drex, which gets really old really quick. This is going to be like taking a bone from a puppy. <laughs> the buddies fight him at the farm at the climax of the movie and literally do everything they did already in the training montage again, this time against Drex. Nothing new, 
nothing interesting, no curveballs, just perfectly using all of the exact exercises they did with Captain K-9. And it's so boring, because we've seen them do everything already. Like, why was there a training montage, and why was it so long? Once they kill Drex by giving him the fake rings of Inspiron, we get to meet Captain K-9's furry alien wife. Oh god! That might be the scariest thing in any of these movies. Uh. <laughs> and then Captain K-9 reveals his true alien self also. It's just so weird. He parts ways with Kid Courageous and goes back to his home planet. Something you might notice about these movies is that they can never get the puppies to pose right. One of them is always like crooked and like bent to the side. And look how scared this puppy plays B-Dog gets when this weird alien creature approaches them. I know it's probably just some guy in a suit that they animated over, but he looks so terrified. The buddies say their dog friend goodbye to Captain K-9, who's now this weird alien, and it's just such a weird way to end this movie. Princess Gorilla, I always knew that girls could rule the world, and now after meeting you, I know that we can rule the whole galaxy. Yo, Captain Megasus, if you ever need a charismatic wing dog, I'm your buddy. Catch you later, alien bro Chacho. Excuse me, your highness. I am Monkey. And it all ends with this shot of the buddies standing triumphantly in their costumes with the promise to be continued. And it never was. And it probably never will be because this is the last buddies movie as of the making of this video. And that was 10 years ago. Where is the sequel? Until we meet again, buddies. Thank you, Captain Megasus. Super Buddies sucks dick. <laughs> It's so bad, and I'm glad that I don't have to keep talking about it anymore, and that there's no big epilogue to this section where I talk about how Captain K-9 actually murdered 46 people on the set of the movie. They didn't even give the buddies cool superhero names or anything. They all just go by, like, Super B-Dog and Super Butterball, and it's just so lame. It has so little charm, which is really the only thing going for most of these movies. I'm sorry, I didn't want to be so negative in this video, but you see what Snow Buddies did to me. The best part about Super Buddies is that occasionally it is laughably bad. Oh baby, slay my jam a dunk. The CGI is just so terrifying, the voice acting is so awful, the pacing is so slow that there are times when you just can't help but laugh at what the hell you're watching. Oh! 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 I know I'm usually super fly, but don't- So yeah. That's Super Buddies. But what if it was directly ripping off an iconic film? Number five on my list goes to Treasure Buddies. It is, it's another day. It's day two of Buddies videos. Yay! When you hear Treasure Buddies, where does your mind go? Perhaps you're thinking, oh, how delightful would it be to see a Buddies film about pirates, or maybe even a remake of the original Treasure Island, but with dogs, much like Muppets Treasure Island, but this time with puppies. Well, Treasure Buddies is Indiana Jones. They just did Indiana Jones. It's the same font and everything. But unfortunately for us, Robert Vince is no Steven Spielberg. He's not even a James Mangold. He's just Robert. Also, this has got to be my least favorite title. I mean, if you're going to do Indiana Jones, shouldn't the title be something along the lines of Adventure Buddies or Temple Buddies or maybe my personal favorite, Stealing Artifacts and Culturally Significant Items That Don't Belong to Us and Profiting Off of Them Buddies. I know, that one's kind of a mouthful. Treasure Buddies begins with a monkey named Bobby telling a story to his little nephew, Babu. What is the greatest treasure you ever found, Uncle Bobby? Oh, that is a very special story that Bobby has not told anyone. Tell Babu! Tell Babu! Please! Okay, it all happened when Bobby met the buddies. I hate this monkey. It sucks too, because I used to be kind of a monkey person, like a monkey lover as a child, but now in particular, capuchin monkeys kind of give me the willies. I don't know how to describe it. Did anyone else grow out of their monkey phase? I'm an orangutan lover for life though, don't get me wrong. Bobby, other than being a monkey, also has the disadvantage of being really fucking annoying. Bobby will give you compass and help you with everything promise to get you to boy. I don't know, something about Bobby speaking exclusively in the third person and mostly in broken English seems 
Racist? Can I say racist? This one follows Mudbud's owner, named Pete, going to Egypt with his grandfather, a world-renowned archaeologist named Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas is Indiana Jones, but he's really old, so they're doing like a crystal skull kind of thing, because of course they are. Also, I don't want to give this movie more credit than it deserves, but they did do a kind of good job at matching the vibe of Raiders, at least in terms of lighting and in this one particular scene. The way the light pours in through the windows is very Spielberg, and even if it was done unintentionally, I don't know, I kind of enjoyed it. And that's about the most amount of effort that they put into anything here, and even if it was done unintentionally or to cover up some sloppy production design, hey, I mean, it kind of worked. Just a fair warning before we really get into this, Treasure Buddies has a lot of random lore that doesn't matter, and you'll start to notice that the movies that I really don't like in this series are the ones that have a lot of crap that doesn't matter. You'll see what I mean as we get into it. So the human characters are going to find the lost tomb of Cleopatra, who is Cleopatra's cat. And they're going with another archaeologist named Philip and his hairless cat. These are our villains, and they are also not my favorite. Philip is pretty campy and can be really comically evil at times, which I always like in these films, but I never feel like the actor playing him particularly commits to his role. Also, the hairless cat is just not a good actor. Not the cat, of course, but the voice actor just doesn't give a shit. When we find the cat's eye jewel, it'll be mine, and cats will finally rule with me as their queen. Of course, the buddies follow the humans. Don't worry, Pete. I'm coming to save you. Help! and end up in Egypt in a strikingly similar way as they do in Snow Buddies, except this time instead of a crate of ice cream, it's a crate of dynamite. Already you'll notice these films tend to repeat each other. Butterball eats the dynamite. Ugh, oh, why is it red? Oh god. Somehow that's not even the grossest fart in these movies. Something that I really love about this film is that the reason Cleopatra's tomb is so coveted is because in ancient Egypt, Cleopatra attempted to steal this necklace that grants any wish, right? And her wish was to make it so cats can rule the world. Then this dog named Budasi comes in and smacks the necklace off of the cat, and then Cleopatra comes in and as a thank you for saving the world and stuff, she makes it so that dogs are a man's best friend. I'm sorry, what? One, this is absurd. Two, how does Cleopatra know that this cat was gonna take over the world? If we are to understand that the rules of these films is that animals and humans can't talk to each other, are we to assume that Cleopatra just guessed? Was she thinking, I just know this cat would take over the world if given the chance? If so, that's awesome. <laughs> Three, I love the idea that a dog being a man's best friend is just like, inherently true by nature and not just this made up thing to sell Hallmark cards and home goods pillows. All we know is the order was changed and dogs became man's best friend and cats were banished. There's so much random shit in this movie that matters so little. Like there's this token that's broken in half and is hyped up as this really important thing, but it's just needed to get into the tomb and then it's not important at all. There, you see? I've got the buddies are related to this archaeologist dog named Digger, but that doesn't matter. They're also related to Budasi. I'm sorry. Are you trying to tell me that golden retrievers existed in ancient Egypt? In ancient Egypt! Oh yeah, and Bobby interrupts the story every five minutes. That's how you met the buddies? You stole Butterball's kebab? You snooze, you lose. And Bobby, winner, winner, kebab dinner. Shut up! Anyway. Shut up! I don't know, despite the amount of lore in this movie, nothing really happens with it. I'd say it's better than Super Buddies because at least it picks up by the third act, but god, the first hour of this thing is so dull. Usually the buddies are like ahead of the humans story-wise, and then the humans just have the B-plot to ground the whole thing in reality. But in Treasure Buddies, the buddies are given the B-plot, and the A-plot consists mostly of Philip trolling Dr. Thomas. The humans in this one are almost always ahead of the buddies, so it just kind of makes the buddies look like idiot baby dogs. Which I know they are, but it's just weak. They meet their dog friend in this movie who is not a dog, but a camel named Cammy. Cammy has one of those baby voices. That mean human stole me from my mother, and he's trying to sell me. Oh, oh 
God, Jesus. Cammie, despite her not actually being a dog, is actually a pretty good dog friend. She actually has a desire to get back to her family. And as one note as that is, it certainly moves the story along and gives a reason for her to be with the buddies. That's usually the function of a dog friend in these movies, to move the story along and give the buddies something to do. The problem is, once Cammie gets back to her family, she just kind of disappears. Oh yeah, this movie is incredibly tone deaf, and by tone deaf, I mean racist. The buddies are right next to the pyramids in Egypt, and they're in this little town full of like traders and barterers and such. Do you know what Giza looks like? It looks like this. Has Robert Vince ever left his house? <laughs> also, when they discover the lost tomb of Cleopatra, it's a pyramid. An undiscovered pyramid. In Egypt! <laughs> How have they not found that yet? It's huge! Also, it's for a cat. A whole pyramid. For a cat. I'm sure it's not shocking any of you that this movie is ridiculous, but come on. There's also this line. Hey you guys, we must have landed in Egypt. It's raining falafel sauce. Which just, like, did you not think that that would sound... Bad. <laughs> it's incredibly tone deaf and just racist. Much like B Dog in this film. My bling? You got to be tripping. Oh no, you didn't call me a scaredy cat. Let me fat words. Meow. Anyway, at the climax of the film, the buddies are finally ahead of the humans and they go through numerous booby traps with ease as the humans fumble behind them and suffer. Finally, something happens. And then there's this part which is just really haunting. <laughs> God, I don't even know what to say about that. My problem with this film and Super Buddies also is that more than anything, after I watched them, I just forgot everything that happened in them. Thank God I took such vigorous notes about both of these, otherwise I would have been totally lost while writing these parts. Anyway, the two old men in this movie have a sword fight, and Dr. Thomas wins and kills Philip or something, and Ubasti, that hairless cat from before, turns into a statue, and Dr. Thomas takes the necklace back to Fernfield, Washington, where it belongs. I'm sure it's trite and rather overplayed to like make fun of Indiana Jones for stuff like this, but knowing the racy and problematic nature of this film, I'm not sure how I feel about this ending. Also, Bobby the monkey is in Fernfield because of course he is. God, this monkey ruins every single part of this movie that could be even halfway decent. Treasure Buddies, <sighs> that's it. <laughs> I think they really shot themselves in the foot with this one too, because they went out to remake one of the most iconic films of all time, but they couldn't even be bothered to create a real action sequence. So the bar is low, even just three movies into this list. Which brings me to number four on my list, Air Buddies. Air Buddies, in many ways, sets the tone for these films, but I find it interesting to visit at this point in the video because we can now sort of see the lineage of these films, and more importantly, these characters. This film is awful, but it is the best film on this list so far, so let's get into it. First, I really like how bonkers the premise of this film is. It gets more unhinged, trust me, but when you first think Air Buddies, what are you thinking? You're thinking, oh, maybe they're just gonna remake the original Air Bud, but with little puppies instead. But I have a sneaking suspicion that your mind is not going to, oh, I bet it's a kidnapping adventure film. The premise of this one is that Air Bud and his wife wife Molly are kidnapped and the buddies have to find them. Yes, Airbud has a wife, and yes, her name is Molly. <laughs> You're gonna have to keep up, there's a lot of stuff to know here. So the film begins with all five of the buddies actually living together with Airbud, and oh boy, do they get up to some shenanigans. Airbud's owners decide that it's time for the buddies to go to their own homes, and this freaks the buddies out, so they run away. Don't blow this ball! <laughs> In the B-plot, there is this very vivacious man named Selkirk, and he sells exotic pets. Selkirk is our villain here, and I'd say he's the first one who has, like, 
a funny character trait. He's just so horribly evil to the point where it just doesn't even make sense. He dresses the most extravagantly out of all of the villains, and he's definitely the most evil looking villain, but unfortunately, he's just barely in the film. He also sells exotic pets out of his winery, which is just weird, and I think it's only a setup so Butterball can get shwasted at the end of this movie. P.U. You stink. That's the weirdest discreet use ever. <laughs> so Selkirk is trying to sell a tiger to this rich boy named Bartleby, who, spoilers, we already know gets Butterball. What do you think, Bartleby? What a great birthday present, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted an animal that I could play with, that plays sports. I want Air Bud! I realized in this movie that Air Bud's name is actually Buddy, which makes it even funnier to me that his kids are called the Buddies. My dad is named Andrew, so that would be sort of like if me and my siblings were called the Andrews. So Selkirk sends his henchman, Denning, out to go kidnap Air Bud, or Buddy. Denning is the least likable character of all time, and it's a bummer because they pair him up with easily the funniest character in maybe all of these movies. That character being great. Grim, who is the villain's nephew, and is also quite possibly the dumbest person ever to live. <laughs> ah. Do you mind not violating Highway Code 401? Just want to see why dogs like it. And his character exists merely to be funny to children. <laughs> the dogs! Mm. Oh. <laughs> they shrunk. It multiplied? And I thought that towards the end of the film that I would get sick of this, right? But something broke deep down within me to the point where I just found this genuinely funny. Oh. Don't look at me, the thing's a gas guzzler. You know, if we had a hybrid, this kind of thing wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. The actor is amazing, by the way, but I also was just baffling to me that the writers thought that this was a good idea. They're in the movie! No, wait! Ah! Danny, I see a bright light. Are we dead? Anyway, Denning and Grimm are spying on Airbud, and Denning comes back to the car, and his face is covered in black makeup. This also broke my brain. I was not expecting for there to be literal blackface in these movies. Jesus, Robert, what are you doing? I don't even know if I can call this blackface. I can't even tell what they were going for here. It is so mind-boggling and baffling that no one stopped this from happening. How does this happen in a film, even if it's direct-to-video, that was made by Disney? Uh Grim and Denning kidnap Airbud and his wife Molly. So the buddies decide that they need to go save their parents, and the rest of the movie is just sort of the buddies in different locations. It's pretty horribly paced and quite boring if I'm being honest. The funniest part to me is when Grim and Denning are chasing the buddies throughout a drive-in movie, and Grim, the idiot that he is, knocks over a bunch of motorcycles. But the bikers, rather than beat up Grim and Denning because of that, they beat them up because they're bullying a bunch of puppies. <laughs> Were you trying to hurt these puppies? No way! Get I don't know, maybe my bar is so low from all of these movies having such awful comedy, but I thought that was a kind of funny subversion. Right before the climax, where I would say the buddies feel like they have lost everything, they meet a wolf who they think is going to kill them. I am puppy! Hear me roar! Roar! Luckily, he just takes them to his house and gives them some really sound advice. I would love to call this wolf the dog friend in this movie, but I actually think he falls more into the mentor category of characters in these films. But if he was a dog friend, he'd be in my top three easily. He's so cool. Why don't you stay with us forever? So you're not all alone. We wolves are needed in the forest as much as you are needed by people. Do you ever get scared? <laughs> Sometimes. But that's why we howl. To let one another know that even though we may feel alone, we never really are. Unnecessarily insightful bars from the wolf there. He's the best part of this movie, easily. Something I realized about all of these films while watching Air Buddies is that no one really does anything for a reason. The way the plot moves forward is very much based around where the writers want the buddies to be at certain points in the film's runtime. Nothing actually happens because of anything, it's just a matter of, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then, and then, and then, and then. You see it in Super 
Buddies, you see it in Treasure Buddies, and you see it in Air Buddies. Snow Buddies, funnily enough, doesn't actually fall into this category because there are tangible stakes and a character who wants something who adds to the plot, but I'm not moving it up the list because the reasons. But in Air Buddies, you really feel the slow pacing due to this method of writing. Nothing the buddies do actually happen because of what they just did. They just sort of move around and say lines that fit their character. You're about to get a lesson in girl power. Girl power? Small power. A big example of this is when the buddies find themselves on a farm and they meet a goat. And there's just no reason for them to be on a farm. I think the only reason in the story that they're there is because it's on the way to where their parents are being held hostage. Nothing feels important because nothing happens with intention. You might see this sort of storytelling in an epic of sorts where a character is moving from point A to point B and there are a lot of little obstacles in the way where they learn a lesson, but in the buddies films, they don't even learn any lessons. <laughs> anyway, they meet this goat voiced by Wallace Shawn. Who goes there? Friend? And the buddies are like blown away that this goat is talking to them. You speak doggy? I'm fluent in horse, cow, chicken, pig, and rooster. I even know a little mouse. What? This... Just, no, this ruins everything. The buddies speak to chickens, horses, cows, and pigs in these movies, not to mention monkeys, camels, cats, aliens, ghosts, elves, reindeers, and sometimes humans. I'm sorry, I just... What are the rules? Are they all different languages? Are you trying to tell me they're all different languages? Are you trying to tell me that the buddies learned all of these languages in their infancy? I might be overthinking these movies. How are these movies just made by one person? It's unbelievable, really, because they just forget that the other ones exist. The pigs in Air Buddies speak Pig Latin, which is fine, until you realize that that means they should have known that in Super Buddies when Mudbud asked them, Mudbud, you dumb shit. Sorry, um sort of lost myself there. Uh, let's jump back into the review. <laughs> if it means anything, B-Dog is actually much less bad in this one, but honestly, all of the characters are just less. Which is a good or bad thing, depending on who you ask. For me, it's much less funny, and you really feel the film struggling because they don't know what the buddies are supposed to say. Uh, but as stupid as Air Buddies is, it really is much better than the other films I've mentioned. So far, it certainly has the most charm to it. The end of the film shows the buddies all separated at different homes, howling to each other to let their siblings know they're never alone. And I found that surprisingly heartwarming, and at the very least, it gave purpose to that random wolf character from the middle of the film. He was just a vessel for the very forced theme of this film, but hey, at least there was a theme. Air Buddies is the most mediocre film on this list. For anyone else, it would probably be one of the worst movies they've seen in their life. But at this point, my scale is broken. I gotta rank these movies on a completely different scale as everyone else because now I get it. Now I understand the Buddies films. They have taken over the last month of my life. The top three, which I'm about to get into, I would say I certainly enjoyed the most and I would maybe consider watching them again. Maybe. We're talking almost exclusively about ironic enjoyment here, but at this point, I'm not sure there's a difference. So let's get into it. Let's get spooky. Number three on my list is Spooky Buddies. If Spooky Buddies was just a title with no movie, it would still be one of my favorite Buddies movies. Especially with this font. Oh, I love this spooky oozing font. I think Spooky Buddies stands out from the rest of the series because it really commits to its genre. That genre being shitty 2000s children's Halloween films. It's chock full of glossy CGI, campy villainy, and dark creaky mansions. I don't know, something about these 2000s Halloween vibes are just so special and it's probably my own nostalgia. In fact, it definitely is, but I love it so much. This was made in 2011 though, so I mean a little late to the game, but it's still fine. Spooky Buddies begins in Fernfield circa 1937 and we get some crazy lore, my favorite. Essentially, there's this warlock named Warwick who wants to summon the Halloween Hound to take over the world. That seems to be the stakes for a lot of these films. The Halloween Hound, to be able to rise to his full power, needs to get this, consume the souls of five puppies of the same blood. 
How awesome is that? So he tries to do this, but it takes too long, and one puppy is left in purgatory, with his soul stuck in the mansion that this whole thing took place in. This... This is terrifying. There's nothing I despise more than petulant young children! I feel like as a child I would be slightly traumatized by the idea that one soul is being ripped from their body as they turn entirely into stone. It's quite haunting imagery. To be honest with you though, this lore that I just gave you does not really affect the film at all. The rest of the film pretty much just follows the buddies going to this haunted house and meeting Pip, the puppy ghost, and running away from the Halloween hound after he's returned. Pip serves as the buddy's dog friend in these movies, and to be honest, he's a pretty good one. But when he's in his ghost form, he just haunts me. I know I'm dogging on the CGI in these films quite a bit, and I understand they are incredibly low budget and are over 10 years old at this point, but geez, this thing looks rough. However, Spooky Buddies gets a pass for most of it because the tone is already so campy and dated that I'm able to excuse a lot of it. But the way Pip looks is just so glossy and uncanny, it just sort of makes me uncomfy. He also has a baby voice, and he's voiced by none other than Frankie Jonas. Wait, why are you afraid? It's just me, Pip. Pip is a pretty solid dog friend, just due to his very tragic backstory and the fact that he just wants to be reunited with his four brothers. I don't think he adds much to the plot, but hey, he's a nice addition. The best part of Spooky Buddies, though, is the Halloween Hound. And yes, I'm pronouncing that with the howl emphasized. He is by far the scariest and most intimidating villain in any of these movies. Just listen to his voice. This time there's nowhere to run. Hello puppies. Just thought I would visit the kitchen for a late night snack. I can help you come from the dark back into the light. I actually like the darkness. Now get out of my way. Every time he spoke, I just burst out laughing because this voice actor is putting everything into this voice to make the Halloween Hound a Halloween icon. Pip. And I still think it's possible. Who cares about Santa Paws? Let's make a movie about the Halloween Hound. I'm fading. Anywho, Spooky Buddies gets bonus points for having not only the Monster Mash in their film, but a really corny knockoff of the Monster Mash too. <laughs> Not many movies have the balls to do something like that, and I respect it. I do find it interesting that the version of the Monster Mash they use is not the original Bobby Boris Pickett version, but a version by a band that seems to also do the knockoff, which is an interesting choice and kind of bizarre, but hey, at least it's here. Anyway, there's this guy who's been possessed by Warwick who's dressed up as a surfer Frankenstein, which yes, is as unfunny as it sounds, and he crashes the spooky <laughs> brew ha ha. That's in Fernfield's yellow building. Can I really quickly just talk about this yellow building? that's in every single buddies film. Usually it's like the community center and sometimes it's a police station and even once it was a museum. Where is this big yellow building and why is it so pivotal to every single buddies film? Betsy, somebody had a bit too much spooky punch. Woo! When I live on that spooky punch. Don't catch me off the spooky. I am nothing if I'm not on that spooky punch. It's just water. Sheriff Dan is a pretty big part in this one too. Not nearly as big of a part as he is in Super Buddies, but this one does follow the trend of him turning into an animal and he turns into a monkey. Dan, <laughs> that is Sheriff Dan. What? Run, kids! He's coming! <laughs> <sighs> I've already done this rant once before, but how can they understand him? Does he speak human still? How does Robert keep forgetting his own rules? He does remember one thing, and that is to make B-Dog racist. Yo, are you hallucinatrippin'? He's got that Halloween hound to do his dirty work now. Man, he calls you names like moronic bird brain. That does sound like something he'd say. I don't know that I have ever heard a piece of fake slang worse than hallucinatrippin', but I need that on a shirt now. Thank you, Robert Vince.
I love you. I think the climax of Spooky Buddies is probably the weirdest across all of the films. It's definitely the most bonkers. Essentially, the Halloween Hound has been chasing the buddies through the mansion and they're finally cornered. Everyone who's on their side has been turned into stone. The buddies have no escape, but B-Dog has an idea. I am worried about showing you this clip because it's just so vile. So be warned. Yo, Butterball, when I tell you, let one rip. Oh. Do it, dog. <laughs> oh. No, <laughs> this can't be happening. Okay, okay, let's let's unpack this. Let's just. Let's just unpack this first. How are Butterball's farts progressively more and more green? Secondly, how did his fart turn the Halloween hound into stone? What has he been eating? Oh my god. Uh, I can't believe this movie is real. So yeah, the buddies give their obligatory dog friend goodbye. It's so great to have a new leash on life. I'll miss you, buddies. Yo, dog, we'll catch you on the flip side. I think what my brother's saying is, we'll never forget you. Hang loose, dude! Now that you can eat again, do me a favor. You need to check out the chili cheese dogs at every town you visit, and tell us which one's the best. Have a great time, Pip. Goodbye, buddies. And that's Spooky Buddies. This one wraps up surprisingly nice, actually, despite there being so much incomprehensible nonsense. It definitely encapsulates an era of children's Halloween films, which I certainly appreciate. Maybe not as well as some others do, but hey, it's worth a mention. The biggest problem with Spooky Buddies is that there really just isn't a story. It's mostly the buddies running from their death, which is awesome, don't get me wrong, but it really falls flat due to the whole, we have literally zero dollars to make this movie thing. I kind of liked this one though. It's garbage, don't get me wrong, but kind of sweet in a weird way. Either that or I've had too much spooky punch. Ah. Number two on my list is Santa Buddies. What's special about Santa Buddies is that more than any of these other films, it actually feels like a movie. It's like a little worse than your average Hallmark movie, but it's still beyond most of the stuff we've seen so far. Low bar. The film begins with yet another dog log. This one from Santa Paws, Santa's dog coworker. You'll never guess the stakes of this film. Get this: they need to save Christmas. Specifically, this dripping phallus from the ceiling that's made of ice that represents Christmas spirit. If the great Christmas icicle continues to melt at this rate. Christmas magic stored in the ice crystal will vanish. I feel like I don't even need to say this, but similar to the apocalypse, these stakes don't really work for me. They're incredibly trite. I will say kudos to this film, however, because it really hammers its pro-Christmas themes directly into your skull. Santa Buddies actually mostly follows Puppy Paws, the son of Santa Paws, who's probably the best dog friend. The reason I say this is because he's the only dog friend who really has a character arc. And to its credit, this actually makes Santa Buddies a much more bearable film to watch. It's still quite painful, but less. Puppy Paws is voiced by the kid who played Greg Heffley and is quite a troublemaker, and according to his dad, Puppy Paws still has a lot to learn. I didn't realize it would cause such havoc. I just wanted to have some fun. Maybe you should be thinking about how important Christmas is to children and puppies all around the world. And what that means is that Puppy Paws needs to be more responsible, and more importantly, he needs to understand the true meaning of Christmas. But I will be honest, it's really hard for me to agree that Puppy Paws needs to change, because at the beginning of the film, he just wants to be a normal puppy, and spoilers, by the end of the film, he doesn't get that. I just want to be an ordinary puppy. You're grounded until further notice. And it makes me kind of sad, because in most children's films like this, you'd expect for the wants of the protagonist to be fulfilled, but here, Puppy Paws just kind of takes over for his dad at the end. He likes it, I guess, but I wish he just got to become a normal little guy with a family or something. I don't know, though. Maybe that lack of wish fulfillment is what makes this movie interesting. It represents how in the real world, sometimes our lives are determined for us, and maybe we are just vessels for Christmas spirit to run rampant through. That, or they just didn't really know how to finish this movie and they forgot to wrap up Puppy Paws arc. But at least they tried. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. <laughs> you uh, pups want to sing along? Yo, I don't sing, I rap. 
Why do we even have to come here? That is B-Dog's first line in this film. And I've watched all seven of these movies, and not once, not once, does B-Dog rap. And I just want to know where that is. I know that Robert Vince, at some point, made Skylar Gisondo the voice of B-Dog, who is also kind of weirdly famous now, and it makes me kind of weird to talk about it in this video. I know that Robert made him rap, and I just want to know where that is. Christopher Lloyd, in hopes of paying off the mortgage of his fourth home, actually appears in this movie as Mr. Crooge, the villain of this film. He plays a dog catcher, and he is one of the best villains in any of these films because he also has an arc. Now listen, he's not just a dog hater in this this movie, right? He's also a Christmas hater. He kidnaps this little dog named Tiny at the beginning of his film. Tiny is Christian. Oh my. Thank you, Lord, for this blessing. Amen. And personally, please don't cancel me for this. I've never been a fan of tiny Christian dogs with high-pitched voices. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Tiny actually sings a song in this movie, so do the elves and Santa, so I guess it's kind of a musical. So let's do what I really love to do here on this YouTube channel, which is analyze songs that are dumb as shit. The elves and Santa sing Jingle Bells in the 12 Days of Christmas, but both with different lyrics, which I find a little bit odd, especially given that the new lyrics are considerably worse. And they did go all the the way out with their monster mash type beat in Spooky Buddies, so they kind of fumbled the bag here. It's two nights till Christmas, there's so much work you see. <laughs> Tie all the ribbon stuff, all the stockings make toys with me. Also, and I don't know why they did this, every time they cut to a close-up shot of a particular elf singing, we actually hear that particular elf singing, and it never doesn't feel really intrusive and awkward. Here's the bell, let's work until we grant each Christmas wish. Hurry up and fill the sleigh with the best things on your list. Hey! Santa makes it fun. He's, He's always, always on, on the, the go. Grant every wish with every gift. Young hearts will live, so come on, help save Christmas with me. And then there's Tiny's song, Christmas Miracle. It's really short, which I gotta say really disappointed me. We need to know that there are Christmas miracles this year. I actually watched this movie last Christmas with my friend Catherine, and because there were so many songs in it, I thought that all of the Buddies movies were going to be musicals, and I was really excited about that, but this one really falls flat on its face. So maybe it's good that they're not all musicals. Christmas Miracle might also be just one of the most basic Christmas songs I've ever heard. We need a Christmas miracle, a Christmas miracle this year. There's also Season of Song, which is more of a piece of score in this film, but I'll count it since it's original to this film and there are lyrics. I actually really like this one. There's a part where all of the houses are being visited by Santa, but it's actually Puppy Paws and the Buddies, and they go to each country and the language changes. And I don't know, as a ride or die of It's a Small World at Disneyland, I find that at least a little bit clever. But in It's a Small World fashion, this also comes with some racial insensitivity. Yeah, this one elf announces each of the countries that they're visiting visiting and he does a different accent for each of them. Mexico City, Mexico. Tokyo, Japan. The island of Jamaica. Hey dude, gnarly dreads. Which is just like, you didn't have to do that. And that's actually the less bad example of that particular elf being racist in this movie. Want to see the worst one? No? I'm sorry. Let's run the diagnostic tests. New Delhi? Very, very much. <laughs> ah, why did the elf have to be racist? Why did you add that to the movie? Robert, I'm asking you. There's a pretty prevalent B-plot about this little boy who is sick with an undisclosed illness. All he wants for Christmas is a dog, but Christopher Lloyd is charging $300 at the pound for Tiny the Singing Christian Dog. She's perfect, I'll take her. That's $300. I thought the puppies were free for adoption. We'll give her a loving home, take good care of her. You're wasting your breath. That doesn't matter to me, I just want the $300. It's for my son, for Christmas. 
He's sick. I love how evil movies make dog catchers seem. It's such an interesting trope to me, and I'm surprised that it took four buddies films for them to get there. Mr. Krooge is just so evil, and I love how Christopher Lloyd is like just bored as hell in this role. You definitely get the vibe that he's just like way too old for this shit, and he just sort of mopes his way through the movie. But I love him though, God bless his heart. You might notice that I haven't really mentioned the buddies in this movie, and that's mostly because they're not really a big part of this one. Their biggest contribution throughout most of the film is saving Puppy Paws when he gets captured, even though it is kind of the buddy's fault that he did get captured because they all sort of just ditched him after he cousin Olivered all of them. B-Dog also break dances in this one. Yeah, you know, bust some moves. Uh, yeah, bust some moves. Watch and learn, cuz. I call this the four paw pop. It's to the boogaloo jaw drop. To the tail rotation for the B-Dog Nation. Yeah, way to break those moves. Yeah, I know. It feels obvious to me, though, why they did make spinoffs with Puppy Paws, because not only is he adorable, he's also actually flawed. Every other dog friend just needs to get home or something, but Puppy Paws actually learns and changes. This is like bare minimum storytelling here, but it's just so refreshing when watching all of these movies back to back. Someone actually put thought into this one. Yo, you straight up tripping? We ain't fallen for that, dog. My favorite character in this one is this dog who's voiced by Richard Kind, who just doesn't look like he should be voiced by Richard Kind. Just watch. I know a lot of things about you, Stan Crude. Are you talking to me? I'm from the North Pole, where we can communicate with all creatures. It's part of the Christmas magic. Santa Claus? Santa Paws? Are you okay? Please, bring back Puppy Paws as fast as you can. Without him, I'm afraid Christmas may be gone forever. So they keep saying this, but I genuinely have no idea why Puppy Paws coming home would save Christmas. Wasn't this a problem before? I know it's sad that he ran away and all, but this film is just having quite a hard time explaining why Puppy Paws is correlated with this magic icicle. Just another moment in these buddies films where there's just too many aspects going on. With a little bit of Puppy Paws Christmas magic, he and the buddies fly to the North Pole, and they end up delivering presents to every kid kid in the world. Again, I get it sort of played out to make fun of old CGI, but there's this weirdly unedited shot of the buddies flying. Just watch it. Guys, uh, wait, does anyone actually know how to get to the North Pole? There's something deeply uncanny about that. B-Dog gets a red nose and says, Now that's tight. My nose shines just like my bling. Robert Vince has never met a black person. <laughs> you guys will never guess how this one ends. They save Christmas. God, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. Finally, as Puppy Paws is forced to go back to the North Pole, but willingly this time, the buddies say their obligatory dog friend goodbye. You're too extraordinary to be ordinary. I feel the same way about you, buddies. Thank you for making us true believers. And for taking us on a way cool adventure. Best time ever! All you can eat cookies and milk? Sign me up! Yo, Puppy Paws, you are now officially part of the B-Dog Nation. You now have four bros and one sis. Maybe you buddies can lend a paw next year as official Santa's helpers. What do you say? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. For shizzle! You know what? I'm just gonna come out and say it. I am a part of B-Dog Nation. I know. I know! We are totally stoked to help Santa, dude. Bro? That would be super rad. So yeah, Santa Buddies is a really messy film, but somehow it is the best out of all of these. And personally, I think it's because it relegates the Buddies to a side character position. The problem with the Buddies is that they were designed to do one thing, and that they literally can never change. Butterball will always be fat, Rosebud will always be a girl boss, Mudbud will always be shitty, Budo will always be praying, and B-Dog will always be rapping. Except that he never raps, but he talks about it a lot. They were designed almost as shitty sitcom characters, unable to go through any change because if they did, well, the show would end. And that's where I feel that Robert Vince and the other people behind the Buddies movies misunderstand how movies work. Contrary to popular belief, movies are supposed to be about the characters. It's actually quite a big part of them. And the Buddies movies 
are hardly about the buddies. They exist entirely around the buddies. Hardly ever do they really affect the plots of the film. They sort of just exist to tell jokes and to fart, which, don't get me wrong, is hilarious, but it just makes for a really weak film. And I'm so sick of hearing people say about movies like this that they're for kids and they don't have to be good, but if you believe that, I don't think that you really have any respect for children. Another problem with these films is that they just start with really broad concepts. It won't start with, hey, let's tell a story story about something, it's more like, hey, let's put the buddies in Egypt. I may be stating the obvious here, but this is a really big problem with all of these films, and you start to wonder, because of this, what am I even watching? Do I feel anything? No. You don't feel emotions when you watch these movies. You don't care about any of the dogs. Your brain is sent into a deep spiral from the offensive content, the horrible dialogue, the sloppy editing, the uncanny CGI, and the despicable direction of these films. You become a shell of a human, only understanding content through the tropes of which it derives from. You start to think like B-Dog. You think like the leader of your posse. You speak in horribly outdated and out-of-touch slang that someone learned from watching a bunch of old episodes of 90s sitcoms. You start to ask yourself, Am I hallucinotrippin'? There is one more Buddies film left. And yes, it is the best one out of all of them. But I have to be honest with you, even the top movie at this list isn't free from ignominy. In fact, it shares a lot of the same problems that all of the other movies have. But what makes it stand out? It has a semi-original story. That was the bar. Okay, fine. Let's do it. Let's talk about the best of the Buddies films. Let's talk Space Buddies. Space Buddies rules. The Buddies go to space. What's not to love? Okay, perhaps you're not sold. You know what? Neither was I. I thought that this was going to be the dumbest one by far. How ridiculous is it that the Buddies leave the planet Earth? and go to space. I was expecting some far-fetched tale about the buddies fighting dog aliens and space ghouls, but no. Space Buddies is the most grounded buddies film out there. And it seems that to become grounded, the buddies needed to take flight. Space Buddies follows Buddha and his boy, Luke Dunphy, who wants to go to space. When I watched this movie with my friend Kim, she pointed out how sad it is that Buddha's boy doesn't get to go to space while the buddies do. And you know what? Yeah. That is really sad. That's just a sad part of this movie that the boy who wants to go to space more than anything in the world watches his dog go to space. I have no rebuttal for that. It's just sad. But in Space Buddies, for the first time, I felt like the buddies were actively moving the plot forward. Their skills and attributes are actually able to come into play in this movie. The characters feel actually purposeful. Even B-Dog. Okay, I'm lying. B-Dog still kind of sucks. Now this joint is off the chain insane, cuz. There's a villain named Doc. Dr. Finkel, just listen to my favorite line delivery in any of these movies. Carl, why is a cappuccino not touching my lips? Don't speak. Dr. Finkel, by far, best villain in any of these films. There. I said it. And as much as I did like Christopher Lloyd, the thing that I was missing in Santa Buddies and in all of the Buddies films, really, is that I never understood why the villains did what they were doing. I mean, Jean George was just racist, Warwick was spooky, Crooge hated Christmas, but Dr. Finkel has, if not entirely bonkers, at least some reason to be doing the evil things that he does. You see, he wants to take down the space station from within and tarnish its reputation by killing five puppies. Okay, maybe it's not like actually ever explained, but this actor put so much into performing as Dr. Finkel that I will forgive him for any of the writing's obvious shortcomings. And Space Buddies has probably my favorite dog friend. Yeah, even more than Puppy Pot. He's a Russian dog named Spudnik, and I don't know if he spells it with a D or with a T. If he spells it with a T, he's named after the Russian satellite Sputnik. But if he spells it with a D, maybe it's a play on how all of the buddies have Bud in their name, and so he's Spudnik with a P still. But there's the D to make it a D. I don't. I'm overthinking this. Anyway, he's Russian and he's so cool and he starts the film with a dogalogue, which is by far my favorite one because it's just so weirdly insightful. Dreams are like stars. You can't touch them, but if you follow them, they will lead you to your destiny. 
I used to dream of being the first dogmonaut to walk on the moon. And now I dream of going home to my boy Sasha. Oh, I forgot to light my candle. I secretly took a break while recording this and didn't tell you guys, but uh, you can tell where that break is now because it's when the candle goes out. I'm sorry. The reason Spudnik is my favorite dog friend, though, is because while he doesn't have a character arc, he does actively save the buddies a lot. He literally saves them from an exploding spaceship. Wait, how do the buddies get to space? This might be, like, the laziest way for the buddies to get anywhere in any of these movies, but it's like... They just wander onto a spaceship, and the next thing you know, this unmanned mission to space has five puppies on it. This is great news for Dr. Finkel, who throughout the rest of the movie does everything in his power to murder these five puppies on this spaceship. These stakes are amazing. The empty oblivion of space is real. Other notable characters include Pi, played by Bill Fagerback, and it's really nice to see someone like actually act in one of these movies. He plays sort of a nervous wreck scientist who's smarter than everyone around him, which is like, you know, an actually interesting character. He certainly serves as a good foil to Dr. Finkel. There's also Gravity, a ferret, who spends most of the movie talking to the buddies through a comm from the space station. I'm Gravity, mission commander's assistant. Oh, are you? Dogling. And how in the universe did you get on board the Vision 1? Which is ridiculous, but after some of the shit I've seen in these movies, didn't even phase me. I feel nothing. Okay, I'm done just praising this movie. Let's talk about the dumb stuff, which happens to be my favorite parts. So if you know me, you'll know I'm not really a big fan of pop culture references in movies and TV. I've actually talked about it kind of extensively on this channel. But when I say that, I feel like there's a very important distinction I need to make. I like pop culture references when they are used to enhance the story or when using tropes to parody a piece of pop culture. There is a big difference between the way a show like Community uses pop culture references in a really clever and brilliant way compared to like, I don't know, Family Guy and Deadpool. So for example, when one of the buddies shouts That sort of stuff just kind of bums me out. It's just lazy and cheap writing. Or like ah, the Death Star! Or even Dudes, I saw the Jamaican bobsled team do this. Really? A cool runnings reference? How dare you reference something so sacred? Something else just kind of insane about this one is that of course they need to meet people on their journey throughout space, and so I was expecting them to meet aliens or something, so it really caught me off guard when they meet this Russian space nomad named Yuri. Yuri might be the most Russian person to ever exist. <laughs> And when I say Russian, I mean like Cold War propaganda Russian. I know. You know what, I'm just gonna list my favorite parts of this one and show you funny clips because I'm just, I'm just done structuring this video. This movie's awesome. So they don't set this up at the beginning of the movie, it's sort of a reveal halfway through, but this unmanned space mission that the buddies have found themselves on is going to the moon? Which they don't explain and just confuses me because why is this space station out of Fernfield, Washington going to the moon with no people? What do they need to learn more about the moon? I'm sure there's shit to learn up there, but like with no people seems pretty counterproductive, no? Spudnik kind of carries the buddies throughout this entire film, which I think is just kind of funny. It just shows how useless the buddies are as characters and he just sort of saves their ass a lot. So how do I explain this? Essentially, Yuri is this cosmonaut that was sent up to space by the Russians, and he doesn't want to go home, so he just kind of stays up there, but he has this dog, Spudnik, who wants to go home to his boy, Sasha. So Spudnik, when he sees the buddies, is like, oh my god, I'm being saved, and ditches Yuri, but it's really hard for him to do that because Yuri is, like, really possessive of his dog, so essentially they blow up his ship, and I thought they were gonna kill Yuri in this really violent way, but I guess he lives, but it looks like he just dies. <laughs> Similarly to Snow Buddies, Space Buddies actually also has a montage of all of the kids being sad that their dogs have run away, which is just so bizarre because their dogs are in space this time. I love puppies and I love my pets, but if they like ran away this often, 
there's something wrong there, right? At a certain point, you start to wonder, like, whose fault is this that these dogs keep running away? I think in real life, most people would say it's the human's fault for their dogs running away constantly, but in this one, it's very clearly that the buddies are just, like, kinda stupid and get lost a lot. Also in this montage, you see Sasha, who is Sputnik's boy, with a statue of Sputnik all sad, which I just think is some of the most effective show-don't-tell storytelling in any of these movies. In any other movie, this would be like way over the top and totally unnecessary, but in Space Buddies and in any of the Buddies films, it's nice to have something. I'm just gonna talk about the CGI again. I'm sorry. It, I know it's bad, but it's so funny in this movie. Like, it's so funny how weird the dogs move around. This is the first Buddies movie that I watched with really bad CGI, so it just blew me away how bizarre and uncanny everything looks. Are you ready to go for the walk of your lives? Good idea, because I gotta take a whiz or something fierce. So Finkel's plan works, and it gets out to the entire world that there are dogs in space. And the way that they show the world learning about this news of puppies in space is by showing news broadcasts throughout the world with dogs watching TV. And of course, they couldn't do this movie without being incredibly problematic, so they show a chihuahua in Mexico watching the news wearing a sombrero. Robert, I'm not even, like, surprised at you anymore. I'm just baffled. Why did they have to do that? And someone in the comments is gonna be like, oh, but they also showed British corgis, so that's all- that's, like, racist against white people, too. But, like, come on. It's famous that British people have corgis. The Queen is British and has corgis, okay? Or I guess had corgis now, huh? I just- why did these silly dog movies have to be racist? I'm sorry to keep harping on them for this, but like, it's weird, right? Anyway, the kids realize that their dogs are in space, so they go to the space station and confront Dr. Finkel, who hacks the mainframe and sends the dogs the opposite way so they'll never come home or something. Again, I just want to talk about Dr. Finkel and how comically evil he is. Like, to be confronted by children that their puppies are in space and still actively try to murder them is crazy, and I love it. Uh, which one is my left paw again? We're doomed. What? It's not my fault I'm dyslexic! It's revealed that Butterball is dyslexic in this one, which doesn't add to my understanding of his character at all, but it is just like a really strangely funny joke. So Butterball goes out into space to fix something on the top of their spaceship, right? And his jetpack runs out of fuel, so Spudnik comes up with a solution to pull his paw so he farts and inflates his spacesuit, and then the gas from that fuels his jetpack so he can move. And like, that's disgusting. And then he says something like, oh, I love the smell of my own farts. I don't know what you guys are always complaining about. It's really not that bad. His farts really add to the story and save them, just like in Spooky Buddies, which is so weird because when I learned that Butterball's main character trait was that he likes to fart a lot, I thought it would never add to the story, and for it to happen twice in these movies is crazy, dude. Darn. Carl? Uh, security. Take Dr. Finkel away. Bye-bye, Dr. Finkel. It's Finkel. I feel like they named him Dr. Finkel just so they could tell that joke. Brilliant. There's a part where Yuri is plummeting down to Earth in a fiery inferno in an escape pod, and Gravity the Ferret, with a calm, tells Spudnik how he can angle him up so he doesn't die on impact and he lands perfectly in Russia. I love that Yuri comes back later in the movie for Spudnik to save. Spudnik is awesome! Anyway, Yuri does end up landing in Russia, and he's greeted by, like, these soldiers and a giant tank, which is just surprisingly relevant. The buddies and Spudnik land on Earth and they give their dog friend goodbye to Spudnik. I'm gonna miss Spudnik. Spudnik is now officially part of my entourage. I'll never forget he taught me to eat my vegetables. He was a rad comrade. He'll have a space in our hearts forever. And this is like the only Buddies movie that I felt strangely emotional about at the end. When Spudnik reunites with Sasha, it just feels so earned and it's really sweet. And then it's immediately undermined by the worst cover of Dancing in the Moonlight that you will ever hear. Moonlight, moonlight. 
I was really surprised with how much I liked Space Buddies. Maybe it's because the bar was just so low, but in all honesty, I think it's the only one of the Buddies films that I would call a decent children's film. It has a theme, and that theme isn't Christmas is cool or go out and fight crime with your dog. It's about beating the odds and about teamwork, and it's about love. I can't believe that that Russian dog seeing his boy for the first time in years after being in space made me that emotional. God. It's the only Buddies movie that made me feel something. And so, for that, it's gotta be number one. So that's all of the Buddies films. <sighs> it's hard to judge these films because I guess, yeah, they are for children, but that doesn't really matter to me because there's something so sacred to me about children's film and television shows. In a way, I feel like I was entirely shaped by the movies and shows that I watched when I was a kid. I would be an incredibly different artist if I didn't find a love for old sitcoms, weird puppet nightmare fuel, schoolhouse rock, Pixar films, and the like. What children watch matters. And of course, I watched my fair share of garbage as a child too, but it's the good stuff that I remember. The Buddies films are not only bad as films, but they're bad as teachers too. They're full of horrible stereotypes, weird lessons, and downright awful storytelling. But as an adult, I can't say I had an awful time watching these movies because they're really funny and I can see and understand those flaws. What worries me is that an impressionable child might find these funny for the wrong reasons, and that scares me. And those funny moments to laugh at don't really make up for the problematic elements of these films. And that's when I realized, these aren't stupid movies made for kids. These are art films made for adults. Yes, it all makes sense. They are critiquing American society through the five worst aspects of Americans. B Dog is racist, Mudbud is dirty, Buddha is blissfully ignorant, Butterball is fat, and Rosebud is a girl boss. Robert Vince is an auteur, you see. He sees the pain and ignorance in America and he's breaking it down from within. He is changing the world. The Buddies movies are cinema. Either that or they're just for babies. Will do, but don't you worry. No more I fear that that's the most riled up I've ever gotten in a video, so thanks for watching the whole thing. Uh, you might notice this is one of the longest videos on my channel. It might actually be the longest. So thanks for sticking around and I apologize for the long wait in between my Newsies video and this one, but I wanted to make sure that I put a lot of love and care into this video because it was a rather big project. Uh, you might notice that the name of the channel has changed. That's just because I would like you to know my name. It's Max. In other news, I'm really excited about the future of the channel. I know I say that at the end of all of my videos, but uh, I have some cool stuff planned for the rest of the year, and I appreciate your patience in waiting in between the last one and this one. I had like a full-time job for the past six weeks that I was pretty occupied with and watching the buddies movies at nighttime. So that was that was a time. <laughs> I have a second channel, by the way. If you want to go watch uh, more of my short film stuff that I used to do on this channel, I decided to split it to another channel just to keep content consistent on here and then keep my other stuff on there. So if you're interested in that, I recommend you check it out. Oh, and thank you for 17,000 subscribers. That's a crazy, insane milestone that uh, I would never have considered a year ago could happen to me. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's not a musical review, which I've been doing a lot here, but I decided to sort of branch out. But don't worry, I'll do more musical reviews. Those will come soon. I have a pretty big one planned and I'm excited about it. Anyway, leave a comment, like, subscribe, do all the things, and uh, I love you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. We will all burn together when we burn. There'll be no need to stand and wait your turn. When it's time for the fallout and St. Peter calls us all out, we'll just drop our agendas and adjourn. <laughs>